Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to um, our Recover and Rise Digital Accelerator series today. Um, as you know, we're on series three, all about systems and productivity. And we've got Chris White, um, Police Detective Inspector, with us today to talk about cybersecurity. Um, but before we move on to Chris, I just want to quickly run through our slides um, to tell you what's happening for the rest of the series, if I may. And apologies, because I know some of you who join regularly will have heard this now quite a few times. Um, so do bear with me, but just very, very quickly. Um, bear with me, my slides don't know. Oh, here we go. So we're on uh, number six, keep your systems and processes safe online. And then on... Thursday this week, we have got our last webinar of this series, uh, Webinar 7, Access the Experts. Now, everybody who's attended our webinars is entitled to eight hours of tailored one-to-one -one business coaching from our digital champions. And if that's something that interests you, do come along on Thursday um, to the webinar because you'll be able to meet our digital champions and just find out a little bit more about the application process, what happens, what you can and can't do, and what sort of support and advice they can give you. So on uh, Thursday, we're opening up our webinar to everyone who wants to find out a little bit more about the Digital Champions and also a little bit more about Coastal Capital, the Business Hot House funding, RISE funding and low case funding. The slides will go out after this um, webinar and they have all the details on them. But you can also now book for the next series of webinars which are going to be delivered by Always Possible in the new year in January. So if you've enjoyed the last three series, please come along in January. And that's all about growth and expansion and how you can use your digital technology to grow your business and develop. So that's really, really useful come January. Um, and as I say, I have been through these quite a few times. So bear with me. But Business Hot House, Low Case and Rise, three really good companies at the moment offering grant funding. And of course, our digital champions. Um, and to access these guys, you just need to go on to Costa Capital, um, onto the website, fill in the contact form, and they will take it from there. And that's a really, really easy way of gaining support for your business. So um, without further ado, let me flip back through my slides and welcome Chris White. Um, who's Police Detective Inspector from the Cyber Innovation at the Cyber Resilience Centre. And I've never known anybody with such a long title. Um, and I've been practising it, Chris, all morning, haven't I? So got that right. Um, Chris is going to talk to us about how we can keep safe online. Um, so if you're ready, Chris, over to you. And thank you ever so much. No worries. Thank you very much. Can only apologise for that long title. <laughs> Right, screens up okay. Hopefully the intro slide's there to be seen. Brilliant, marvellous. Um, yes, morning everyone. Um, Chris White, I'm a um, Sussex Police Officer um, and I'm currently seconded off to the Cyber Resilience Centre for the South East um, as Head of Cyber and Innovation. Um, effectively, not many people know about the Cyber Resilience Centre for South East. It's brand new. The Home Office has created it um, just before the pandemic last year and it got accelerated through because of the, the remote working um, which occurred all over the country. So we are a network of centres um, across the country, just to throw it out there. But I look after the South East Centre, um, which looks after Surrey, Sussex, Hampshire, Isle of Wight and Thames Valley. Um, we're not for profit. Um, we're funded by the Home Office and we're supported by bigger companies that understand that um, the supply chain to cyber attacks is a real risk to everyone. Yes, most of the big companies have access to cyber resources and can immediate, immediately change things and they have access to experts and skills and they can respond to the current environment. Um, and it's probably the smaller businesses that suffer somewhat because they don't all have access to could I say technical geniuses that know how to operate computers that can configure them correctly um, and then can respond to cyber attacks and get them all back to behaving how they should be before the attack happened. So we do get support from the bigger companies and that's how we use the um, students. So I've interviewed plenty of students from all the local universities. So we're looking at Portsmouth, Southampton, New Bucks, Oxford and Surrey. And we're particularly focusing on those universities because they have computer science and cyber crime degree courses. And we've interviewed the students and they are young, talented, gifted individuals. 
um, that know what they're up to on computers, they're learning it, they've been mentored by us, they're supported, vetted, um, and they work with us and they are helping us deliver um, cyber support to smaller businesses, micros, mediums and large. Um, we'll go through that later on, but effectively I'm just gonna cover off um, who we work with, who we cover, there's the universities and the police forces and the areas which I'm covering. Um, but today we're gonna talk about cyber, awareness, cybersecurity, and effectively how we can make you safer to trade, live and work online in Western East Sussex. So the cybersecurity breach surveys, the, the, the last national survey done, um, whereby a lot of results um, were recovered across a variety of people. But looking at those stats there on screen, it's not really too surprising at the moment. I mean, 39% of UK businesses have all had a cybersecurity attack at least once in the last 12 months. Um, not many of us actually, practice for um, cyber instance. So rather like we grew up in school, didn't we? Fire alarm used to go off every Friday morning. Um, we practice how to get out of buildings safely because fire was a real risk. And um, we've got miles better than that. Um, again, we do CPR trains, don't we? We're better at that. We can all do first aid. Um, cyber is probably the new threat. Well, it is the new threat, um, but not many of us are practicing. So I know we probably haven't done it at home, but at work, have you ever practice with your staff as a business owner or has the business owner encouraged you as staff to know what to do when computers start going wrong who you phone up um, sometimes the IT help desk number is on the very computer that's having a cyber attack and you can't get hold of IT because you don't know the number so yeah looking at those stats um, the one that probably does concern me is this one eight and a half thousand pounds average cost of businesses after a cyber attack to get yourself back up and running and that could be anything from repairing computers to lost trade to staff that are now not doing the job that they've been employed to do because they're now actually trying to get the computers back online or manually populating databases again so as a result of a cyber attack just uh, over 23% of people realized that they need to change their cyber security to manage the new threat so strange stats, but why is it happening? Because only what, 14% of staff get any training in computers. There is a massive assumption out there that we all know what we're doing with computers. We all know how to recognize when they're going wrong. We all know how to fix them when they're going wrong. But it's a little bit the opposite. Most of the cyber attacks which I see coming in all start um, with what's called phishing, um, a phishing email. Um, and that's about 83% of all attacks come in with a successful payload, the ability to successfully deliver um, a cyber attack through a phishing email. So if we drill down some of those figures into the local crime stats, so this, um, I can't get this drilled down to any further than the southeast region at the moment. So when we look at some of these statistics over the last couple of quarters, email or social media compromise, well, email accounts, I understand, and I know they're massively important to small business. So if we look at things like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all of these um, social media platforms are the way you advertise, the way you gain traction, the way you build revenue, the way you advertise your business, because small business generally do advertise on these marketing channels. So when you create your account, you reserve your business organizational name, normally it matches your website, and then you have your online footprint and digital presence, uh, and then you're protecting it and then just using it as your sales revenue. So when you set it up, you usually apply your email address, then your password. Some people go that next stage further and apply what's called two-factor authentication, which could be that rotating six-digit six code number that's on an authenticator app, or you just run a text message being sent from um, Instagram or Facebook, realistically, to the mobile phone that's registered in that account. So an email or social media compromise is someone has guessed your password, managed to get into your email account, changed the password, kicked you out, and now you don't have access to either that email account or that social media platform. So that's what's classed as a social media compromise. And in this um, particular Southeast of England, over the last couple of quarters, we've seen 38 instances and 35 instances, so a little bit of a downward trend, but not a massive negotiable, notifiable one. A network intrusion. So. That's when someone gets into your, I, I could say, office networks. They've managed to get through your firewall and then now compromised your security and they're inside your systems, having a look at what they can see. So rather like someone, um, you know, you get those unannounced visitors or a stranger that's in your office walking around, just looking at files and so forth. 
there's a stranger in the office, you would challenge it because you can see it, it's quite obvious. But a network intrusion is when someone gets into your system. They probably, you probably don't know they're in there, but they've compromised and they're having a look around unchallenged to see what they can see. Um, DDoS, denial of service or distributed denial of service. The easiest way I can explain that is if you um, have a big football match or a concert where all the tickets are released and everyone at nine o'clock in the morning jumps onto the ticket selling website because they want a ticket. Within about a couple of minutes, the website falls over because it's just received an unimaginable amount of website traffic in it. The computer simply cannot handle that much of traffic. So too many visitors flood one website and it falls over because it can't handle the traffic. That's like a legitimate example. An illegitimate or unlawful example is DDoS. When you instruct many computers to flood one computer with so much traffic, um, the computer falls over. So as a small business owner, if um, I could pay a cyber criminal, about $50 an hour to flood your website with so much traffic, your computers fall over. And then the consequences of that are you cannot then trade until you sort your systems out, reset them, get them back online. So that's DDoSing. Ransomware. So I've compromised your systems and then I've left some malicious software on your systems. Um, either it's encrypting all your critical data. So your sales data, your staff payroll pension data, um, or your intellectual property, all the stuff that you're trying to sell and protect. So ransomware will encrypt it. I'll take a copy of it. Um, you cannot see it. And then there will be one note left on your file telling you these are the instructions you need to follow to try and get your data back. And it normally involves you paying me as the criminal to get your data back. That's the first part of ransomware, the first stage. There's double ransom now, sadly. It's called exfiltration. So once um, I've encrypted the data, you've paid me, it could be anything from thousands to tens of thousands of pounds to get your data back. You then do it. There's a 50-50 chance that you may or may not get your data back. Um, that secondly, once you have your data back, I then send you a second ransom in saying, by the way, I took a copy of your data. If you don't want to let me publicly release it, I suggest you pay a second ransom. Um, and that's exfiltration and exposure. So I could upload all of your private customer, private company data onto the dark web for anyone to see. And then you could understand what goes on there. Competitors will see your pricing strategy and will just permanently try and undercut you. Um, customers would lose faith in you and wouldn't want to trade with you because um, they, they feel that your systems aren't secure enough and they can't trust you. And then you just lose a customer naturally. So PBX hacking, so that's sometimes you have, um, the bigger the business, they may have computers. So VoIP, voice over internet protocol, you use computers or the internet to make phone calls. Um, so those systems that are specifically responsible for managing your telecommunications or your phone systems, they can get hacked as well. I've seen examples of that where sometimes people hack those systems overnight and then they just spend all night phone and premium rate international phone numbers. Um, so you wouldn't know anything's happened because they'd stop the attack before you come to work the following morning. And you usually, I think most small businesses get monthly phone bills and you would then get a horrendously big monthly phone bill the next month. So PBX hacking is another one of those. Not frequently used, but it is out there. Certainly, um, to prevent or mitigate against that, good examples that I would suggest is if you phone up your phone provider on your mobile and your office phone and just tell them to prevent um, international phone calls by default and prevent premium rate numbers by default. I can't remember the last time I dialed an international premium rate number because you can WhatsApp and FaceTime and do all different free style of phone calls these days. So. Phone your phone provider and just get those things blocked by default. And then that's a good mitigation for that one. Um, website vulnerability or domain redirection. So I could pretend to be um, you. So if we all pick Google, that's a good example. Google's G double O G L E. So you know on the E, if you change that with a French E, put the accent over the top of it, and then type in G O O G L on the French E.com, that would take you to a different website. So you've got website redirection and impersonation crime. So it's just be wary of that. When you type in a website, make sure it's typed in exactly the correct um, alphanumerical character that you want to visit. So you've got the French O, haven't you, with the two dots over it. That could take you to a different website. Um, just be wary of that. 
Data breaches, we've probably heard loads of these on the, the press and the news at the moment. They normally occur after your network's been intruded, normally occur after ransomware has been left on your system. And then the data breach is where obviously someone's stolen the data, maybe uploaded it so everyone can see the data. Yes, that is a data breach, data instant, one to be wary of. Um, and then a baseless extortion threat. So examples of that is um, I've seen various companies that say, if you don't pay me so much money, I'm going to DDoS you. So at your peak trading hours, I don't know if you run like a, a fast food company, you'd suggest your peak trading hours would be lunchtime, evening, weekend, when a lot of people jump onto things like Just Eat, Uber, um, Deliveroo, and they order food using your website that if I decided to DDoS you during those peak hours, your website is unable to operate or trade, so you miss out on that. So if you don't want me to DDoS you, pay me £500, for instance. Um, that's a baseless extortion threat. So who's doing all of this stuff? Ranges. There's a massive range. So as you look at these pictures, it starts from basic online criminals all the way over to, um, sadly, foreign governments, foreign state actors. So, and then we move all the way to the, the member of staff um, that had honest intentions, didn't know what they were doing, pressed the wrong button and could have deleted a, a really important database. Um, they didn't do it on purpose, but they're not trained correctly in computers. There's an assumption they know what they're up to and it all went wrong. Then you've got the militia staff. So bottom right there is an example. Um, that was um, the guy with the sunglasses on his head. He was a network manager, worked for a big insurance company. And I think it must have been a midlife crisis time when he needed more money. Um, he felt like he wasn't being treated well at work, didn't get the, a, a great annual appraisal, therefore didn't get um, the annual increments. And he decided to go rogue. Um, and he had administrators access to the computer systems he was looking after. And he just caused all amounts of chaos. So he's what we class as an insider threat, a member of staff that goes rogue. So realistically, if you're going to have... Um, those meetings without tea with your members of staff um, that sadly that have spent time with your company and their skills and resources no longer needed. If they've got password access to some of your systems and whether they've got administrator access to some of your systems, you definitely need to ensure that you've got an exit policy for when staff leave. So rather like you take company uniform, company laptops, keys, phones off of them, you just got to make sure that you refresh all the passwords as well that they're likely to have access to. So things like your website, your social media platforms, um, remote home working, they can log into the systems. Um, so you've got to make sure you sever that link when members of staff leave, especially consider any IT staff as well that look after your systems that have administrator access. You've got to make sure all of the administrator keys are changed as well. If I am going too technical, please um, jump in the chat room. Um, I'm open to any questions throughout to articulate or explain things any better. So please let me know. Um, you've got then organised crime groups. So I guess in the olden days, you could have organised crime groups that would, if you're walking down the street, and sadly some people do robberies and they'd steal your mobile phone. But the manufacturers have changed um, some technology so you can stun mobile phones these days. So the likelihood of um, people robbing you for your mobile phone is been heavily reduced now so you get organized crime groups that are changing the way they um create their crime trends so they're now looking to come through your router because sadly again we don't um, treat our online security the same we do when we all left the home this morning so where we locked the door sometimes we double lock the door we made sure all the windows are closed um and we set the burglar did you do the same sort of routine for your router so Doors and windows are called ports on a router. And if you have any ports that are open, do they need to be open? Some ports do need to be open, yes. So if you've got like a, a nest doorbell, or ring doorbell, or you have, um, you like to surf the internet home, or the kids like to use the Xbox and so forth, certain ports have certain functions. And yes, they do need to be open, but they also need to be protected. And those ports that aren't needed, close them. And the same works in a business. If you have a router, you don't need everything open. Um, but just check. So how are things happening? So when we look at the, the cyber security breaches survey, this is broken down, color coded into obviously business, primary schools, secondary schools and further education colleges. So we're, we're going to be focusing the majority, I think the audience are going to be businesses. So we're looking at the blue here. 
phishing attacks seem to be the overwhelming um, method, successful method of delivering a cyber attack at the moment. So I send you a phishing email. There's about three or four different main types of phishing emails. One of them is I want you to click on the attachment and the attachment is the dangerous bit. I want you to take you to a dodgy website or I want you to provide me with some personal identifiable information. Generally, you got to do it now. It's always urgent. And if you don't do it now, something bad's going to happen. Generally, we don't send those sort of emails, do we, when you're trying to um, create business? Um, we do it in a relaxed method. We do it when you're ready as the customer. Yeah, I guess there's like things like Black Friday and Cyber Monday sales on where if you want to grab that bargain, you must buy it by the end of play on Monday. That's an obvious one, but you've got a deadline five o'clock tonight to do this or you'll miss out on this. It doesn't really happen. So if you get some urgency behind of an email to say you're going to get into trouble or you're going to miss out on something amazing, normally it's too good to be true. So then going down this list, um, the threats, uh, others impersonating organisation emails. So if you own your own business um, and you've got business email, you've got a business website, you need to protect yourself from being impersonated. So if I find a business that um, is doing amazingly well, then I want a slice of that cake as well as a criminal. So if I pretend to be you, because you've got a good reputation, you've got a good trademark, then people are buying stuff off of you all the time. If I just pretend to be you, send out an email on your behalf to a load of people saying, if you want to buy this, I'm doing an extra 20% off because it's you or 15% off. So you make it sound rather reasonable. Um, and then press the click here button to send the money to me. Obviously, the genuine company is never going to see that email. The bank account's not going to be yours. It's going to be mine. I'm going to have your branding, your logos. I'm basically impersonating you. There are easy ways to stop that. So if you're using cloud email or your own email host facilities, there's something called DMARC, which is D-M-A-R-C. Um, it's part of email security. So you need to set up certain policies to protect your own brand, your own reputation, and prevent people sending impersonation phishing emails on your behalf. So have a look. Um, for those of you that understand that sort of thing, great. Have a look at your DMARC policy and see whether it's turned on or whether you have a policy. For those of you that are already going, Chris, you're off. You're, <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, that's where the Cyber Resilience Centre can help out. So certainly things like this after the call, please do join the centre and we can have a conversation where we can explain this. But you can most of the stuff that I talk about, you can Google. So D-M-A-R-C. And it's part of a functionality where you can prevent people sending phishing emails on your behalf. Um, so have a look at that sort of stuff. Viruses, spyware and malware. Um, again, I think like we have computers at home these days, everyone needs virus and malware protection on their computers. It's a sin not to have it these days. So you need to have it on, turned on, and getting daily updates. Yes, there is a difference between paid for virus protection products and free virus protection products. But simply, if you have a free virus protection product installed operating on your system that connects to the internet daily to get the latest virus or antivirus signatures, that is also, it doesn't matter whether it's free or paid for. Yes, more paid for products come with lots of bells and whistles. But as long as your virus protection is up to date, installed, turned on and getting its daily updates, that is fine. So a lot of Windows users I expect on the call. If you've got um, Windows 10 and you've got Defender, totally adequate, totally suitable. Just make sure it's turned on, doing its job and it's getting its daily updates. Um, unauthorized access in the files, networks by students. Um, again, that does work in a business environment. So if you work in the sales team, you get to see sales data. If you work in the HR team, you get to see the HR data. Sales don't have to see HR and HR don't have to see sales. So you segregate the files. Your staff only see what they need to see. So it's the privilege of least principle. They only get to see and do what they need to do to undertake their role. You don't give them access to all areas. So GDPR are obviously we're all aware of our GDPR training. People only need access to the stuff they need to do to undertake their job role. Do not give everyone access all areas. Um, DDoS attacks, denial of service attacks. There are plenty of things you can put into place to stop that style of thing. Um, we can talk about that offline, but the most obvious one there is Cloudflare, but that is a paid for service. So if someone decides to send loads of traffic to your website, Cloudflare can send it all over the show and protect your website so it never goes down. Hacking, 
attempted hacking of online bank accounts. I think banks have got a little bit more serious over that and us as end users have got serious of that. We download apps now, we have authenticator apps, we get text messages sent to us with codes, which we then put in the apps. We don't set up new payees without phoning the business on the trusted number using a genuine search engine to go through the core handling center. I know often it's us, people have said to me that I know I'm getting through to the right company because I've gone through their core handling center and I've been on hold for ages. Normally the criminals will answer their phones so much quicker um, because they want your money, don't they? So they have better customer service. Then we're accessing the files. So that's curious stuff, the insider threat that just mooching around the systems and having a look at files which they shouldn't need. You can protect that by technically preventing them to do that. I know a lot of businesses have what's called honor policies. So you tell the staff, please don't do that. And you're reliant on them not doing it, but you can actually put a technical policy in to prevent those that get curious and then try that they then get prevented from doing that. So phishing emails, look at those figures then, 156 million phishing emails are sent around the world every day. 16 million of those get past technical filters. So that's the firewalls and the spam protection. And then 8 million still get opened. So this is why the criminals are doing it because 8 million of us every day are still opening those phishing emails. So let's see how we can try and stop that. So hopefully that made more sense in a more animated way. Um, so let's start with the quiz show now then, or well, not the quiz show, just um, some questions. So in the chat room then, what's wrong with this email? It is a phishing email. What the signs and symptoms that you can pick up on here? So I can just test knowledge of everyone. There's one, two, three, four. There's five things which, um, I could see wrong with this email and each one of them, I would delete it straight away. So any suggestions?
like that. So as we going through punctuation, print, yeah, spy killer, like that. So if we have a look at the emails we go through, so time and date, they've been around my house to deliver a parcel at 4.49 in the morning. Really? I don't think I've ever had a delivery at that time of the day. So have a look at the time date stamp just to see whether or not um, it matches the, the kind of service which they're trying to deliver or get you to do. So you know on a computer you can hover your mouse over the title or if you're on a smartphone you can actually press it and it will see it will, sh it will show you the actual email address behind it so that one comes from ntxresearch.com so if we go back there the criminals have made it look as if it comes from ups.com but you can majority of you can actually change the header to say what you want so it actually has come from ntxresearch.com, which is nothing to do with UPS. So that one's again, straight delete on that one. The attachment, we all recognize that certain attachments are particularly dangerous. So .zip files, .x file, .aexe, sorry, .rar. Generally, most attachments um, could come with an element of danger. So if we look at the Microsoft files, so you've got X. Excel, PowerPoint, Word, you can hide what's called a, a macro virus in um, most Microsoft files. So a macro virus, um, if you press enable macros, or if the Excel, for instance, opens up in protected view, depending on which version of um, Office 365 you've got, the safe way is have macros disabled and all of your Microsoft products open up in protected view because the moment you enable it, you enable code in the background to, to work on the computer and you can send a perfectly good virus in an Excel. You can send a virus in a JPEG, sadly. Um, so just make sure that you've got your malware protection working so it scans all of the attachments and only open up attachments that are from trusted people that you're expecting. And again, I know they're trusted, but you don't know whether their machine actually has a virus on it and they could have sent it to you by mistake. So it's just be very careful. You don't always have to open up any of the Microsoft stuff um, out of protected view or unless you're doing that sort of thing. Again, dear customer, it's vague, isn't it? They should know my name's dear Chris. If they've been around my house to deliver a parcel, at least email me by my name. So if it's vague, they don't know. And then again, punctuation, but we do know they're getting better at punctuation. So here's another one then from barclaycard.com. Again, hover over the uh, email sender. We know that one's come from cybermarket24.ru. So that's come from somewhere in Russia. Last time I checked, Barclay Card was not based in Russia. You've got cut and paste there is there. You've got to get started. If you hover across that, you'll see it goes nowhere near Barclay Card. So that's they're trying to send you to a dodgy website there to get your details. And again, it's a branding thing down the bottom. They never call themselves Barclay Credit Card. They are Barclay Card, not Barclay Credit Card. So TV licensing, hands up, who hasn't had this one? Um, I think everyone's had the TV licensing one at the moment. Again, insightbase.com, hover over the, the sending email. You'll see that it's nowhere from TV licensing. And again, set you up a new direct debit. They just want to take you to um, another dodgy website. So that's the one where it's going to take you. I can't even pronounce that, but I know that's not the UK TV licensing website. And again, I know Curiosity Killed the Cat, and we always love to know what happens if you do click these things, so I've done it for you. So this is the website. It doesn't matter whether you press pay for TV license, update your details, check if you need one on the left-hand side. It will always take you to the payment screen where it wants those details you can see there on the right-hand side. So... Official identity, mother's maiden name. Why do they want that? Because that's quite often a password reset question. Um, so they want to get some of these personal identifiable details out of you. I mean, if they, you don't have to do the mother's maiden name because you can easily find that on ancestry.com these days. So if it takes you to this website, this is a real genuine website. It's been infected with malware. So it's been recorded real time. So we've been on this website now about five seconds. We've clicked on one of the folders there, the obituary column. We can see the blue circle going round. And you're just thinking to yourself now, oh, this is a slow website or my machine maybe is a bit slow or my own broadband's a bit slow. So you're just waiting for it to load. Down the bottom there, Windows Security Center turn, turned off on the right. That would be worrying to me. So now your security's been turned off. Why has it done that? But I can tell you, 
it's a little bit too late now. So we're what, 35 seconds into this and now the ransomware has kicked in. So that's the sort of screen you're gonna see when ransomware's taken over. So that was what, 38 seconds from hitting that website to clicking on one of the areas, all of your files on your machine is now encrypted. So you can't access your photos, your Word documents, nothing. The only file that you'll see there that you can access will be the instructions from the ransomware actors telling you how to get into contact with them and how much money it's going to cost you to get your data back. So one of the great um, resilience or great insurances to that is that if you have a backup available, um, which is not connected to the internet, you wipe your machine to start all over again, and then you restore from your backup. That's the only way you're going to get around this. Yes, there is another way, obviously, you pay the ransomware threat as the money that they're after, but there's only a 50-50 chance you're actually going to get your stuff back. So the way out of ransomware is to make sure you have a backup. So I know quite a few of you are probably using OneDrive, Dropbox, iCloud. So they're all good in relation to if your laptop or your computer in the workplace actually physically breaks, then there is the backup being held in the cloud. But if I'm one of these modern day threat actors that if I compromise your systems, I drop the ransomware onto your systems, I won't do it until I have a look around your systems and see what your, your storage solutions are. So if I see that you're using OneDrive, for instance, I will delete that as well. So you've got to make sure that you've got your own offline backup available. That could be anything from an encrypted memory stick to an external hard drive that you just, if you're a small business, you just plug into your computers and you just take a weekly backup or a daily backup or a monthly backup. It depends how busy your business is, but just make sure you've got a backup available. So I know that was quite frightening, but effectively, if we go back to a couple of years ago, there was a big incident called WannaCry, which affected the NHS. Um, so someone clicked on a phishing email and two hours, 36 minutes later, some of us can remember that, that most of the hospitals, if not all of the hospitals in the country were ground to a halt because of that one person clicking on a phishing email and then it, the ransomware just spread across the whole network. So just bear that in mind. It, it does spread quite quickly. Um, the sad story over that one is that the security patch that windows had already created to prevent that vulnerability had already been published but um, those computers hadn't been updated so the cure there is to make sure that your windows machine when it tells you bottom right you get a little orange sign or your iphone you get a red circle with a white number in it or your android phone if it tells you you're due an update it's not some fantastic new facility is telling you it's got a weakness of vulnerability so download that update get it on there and make sure you're on the latest version and if any of you are using xp or windows 7 they don't get supported anymore so don't use them or use them but don't plug them into the internet they're just vulnerable to the internet okay passwords so passwords here then that's, that's how easy they are to crack so that's why we shouldn't be using one, two, three, four, five, six, or eight, nine, or picture, or definitely not password is password. That's how quickly you can crack those passwords. They are very insecure because they're so predictable. You can program a computer to do what's called a brute force attack, and it will try the most common passwords first. And those are the common passwords. So if you are still using those sort of passwords, please don't. By asking them to tell us their password and... <laughs> This is how that went. We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua Papillon. And what's its name? Jameson. Jameson. And where did you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. <laughs> It's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. But, Has you had this cat for a while? Yeah. She's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. So like a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. And what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So Jolie, 6, 12, 12 95. 95. Yes. Got it. 
So you mean to give my password right now? No, I cannot do that. But we all want to know what it is so we can tell you if it's strong or not. Oh my goodness. Um, um, let me think. Okay, one is Tel Aviv. Yeah. Four, six, eight. And then Israel. It's, it's only three, but it's, you know, it's, uh, for me it's strong enough. Ireland, one, two, three, four. Gemma, one, two, three. Spell G E M M A. Well, most of them are Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Like so, what? like, like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. What's your grandma's um, name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So, Maria is your password? Oh, well, yeah. Now you know my password. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I think the key there is that most of those passwords those people selected were um, connected to them somehow, whether it's through birthplace or favorite things. So if we can try and move away from password, choose your new password, and make it a passphrase. So pick three random words that have got nothing to do with you, bolt them together. And ideally we want a passphrase that lasts around 13 characters long. So you might've heard of, um, a security framework called cyber essentials they require all minimum password lengths to be seven but if you can use a passphrase and just bolt three words together and work for about 13 characters long i know it seems long but um the longer the better and make three random words or easy to spell words and you've got yourself a really strong passphrase yes some people have multiple um, accounts. Um, how do you remember all those passwords? Certainly make sure your email password is separate from all your other accounts. So things like Amazon, Facebook, Sainsbury's, Tesco's, just make sure you always have a different password for your email account to all your other accounts. Why? Because the easiest way for me to um, change all your passwords is get into your email account and then click the I forgot my password button and then I can reset all your passwords because the reset link always comes back to your main email account so examples here things like london beach music if you want to get really advanced change all the n's to sevens and the e's to three so you've got lo7 do7 b3 ach music which is a incredibly complex but london beach music is pretty good but if you want to go that one step further go for it so when we talk about cracking passwords QWERTY, we spoke about that one, really predictable and simple, takes 15 seconds to hack it. Coffee Tiny Fish, again, takes six hours. If you complicate it and add something on the back and front of it, Coffee Tiny Fish, so you've capitalized every word. So that is, again, different, capitalize each word and then put something on the end of it. Can't be hacked for six years. So Coffee Tiny Fish, easy to remember, capitalize all the words and add something on the end. You've now got yourself a complex password easy to remember all right two-factor authentication we spoke about this before where it is accessible it's mandatory on most banks now you have to have 2fa turned on because of the financial requirements things like ebay facebook instagram everywhere it's there sometimes it may be sat in hidden menus but it's certainly in security menus where 2fa is available please turn it on stops the majority of cybercrime, which i get to see every week of most small businesses that they chose their Facebook or their Instagram account, their selling pages is something connected to the owner of the business or something to do with the business. I then try to log into the account. I tried a couple of passwords. I guessed right. I then got into their account. I kicked them out of their own account. Had 2FA been turned on, you'd get the text message come to your phone saying, here's your six digit number. If you did it yourself, you'd be expecting a number. But if you wake up in the morning and you've got a 2FA note of text message notification sat there on your phone and it's your business and you know no one should have done that that's your hint that's your reminder to say someone now knows your password and that's your clue to changing your password because it's compromised there's only two occasions you change your passwords these days one when you know it's been compromised and another one when you've been told it's compromised otherwise keep really long complex password for as long as possible because as long as it's long and complex, if I force you to change one the next time you log in, you're just going to pick a weaker one, aren't you? I know what we're like. Certainly the days where passwords were forced to be changed every 
90 days, I think it was, you'd just pick January 1, 90 days would be January 2, then January 3. That's how our human brains work. So just pick a long, complex password. Cover off data breaches. Have a look at this website. Google it. Have I been pwned? P-W-N-E-D. So make sure you get the spelling correctly. I wish you'll go somewhere else. But certainly have a look. Put your own email address in there and you'll see how many data breaches your email address has been involved in or compromised in. Look through them all and then make sure that you've changed your password since the date of that data breach. So that's a handy tip. And then register for future notifications. So if your email address is involved in any future data breaches, you'll get an email from Have I Been Pwned. And then again, that's your clue, your hint to change your password. So have a look at that one. Definition of a secure device. So update your operating system, make sure it's on the latest updates. Back up your data. And then when you completed your backup, unplug it from the internet. So it's an offline backup. Make sure your antivirus is on and getting its daily updates. Make sure your firewall is turned on. 2FA, use it where you can. Virtual private network is called a VPN for short. If you're going to go and use public Wi-Fi, so you're going to go to a cafe or a pub or an airport and you're going to use their free Wi-Fi, only do it if you're using a virtual private network, a VPN. If not, stay on your 3, 4 or 5G phones because it's a far more encrypted signal. So I know there's some reasons why people do jump onto public Wi-Fi, i.e. they can't get a mobile phone signal, but if you can, stay on your mobile phone signal. Use a password manager. They're on your phones, they're in your password vaults, or they're on your computers, and they're called password browsers. Use them. They can create long, complex passwords. You therefore only have your password, and that's to get into the password manager. So certainly use the option of a password manager on your smartphone device or a browser password manager on your laptop or desktop. If you've got a smart device, again, make sure the screen locks are turned on, whether it's pin, pattern, fingerprint, face or password, just make sure you have a screen lock on. So if someone steals it or you put it down, there's no unlawful use because it's protected. And when it's protected, it's encrypted as well. If you don't have the screen lock on, none of the data on there is encrypted. So make sure that's turned on. At work, separate user, for every separate account. You can't have shared team accounts. I know that sometimes does cause issues in smaller businesses, but realistically in accountability, everyone needs their own individual account. And then encryption. So on Windows, make sure the BitLock is turned on. So again, if your shop or office gets broken into and they actually steal the computer, they can't get anything off the hard drive because it's encrypted. So you're not going to fall foul of GDPR. So just make sure wherever you save your data, Windows does give you a free option of using BitLocker. So just make sure that's turned on. Cyber Essentials. £300 plus VAT it costs to get Cyber Essentials. However, it, once you self-assess and you change some of your security to start your safe cybersecurity journey, you are entitled to free cyber insurance. So have a look at that. If you don't have cyber insurance, it's probably one to have a discussion with me after, but certainly Cyber Essentials is a good start for 10 to get your cybersecurity in your business on the right journey to make you safer. So oh, quiz time then. So come on in the chat room, let's go. What's wrong with this phishing email? The address, yes, got it. See at the top, two Vs pushed together to look like a W, natvest.com or natwestbank.com. Well done on that one, those of you who got that one. Number two then, what's wrong with this one? Office 365 has emailed you to say something wrong with your account. What are you gonna do? Is it genuine? Should you report it? So, it's the email address again. So eastlink.ca, that's nothing to do with Microsoft. So again, we report this one off to our IT team, get it blocked. Additionally, if you forward it off to report at phishing.gov.uk, National Cyber Security Centre will effectively stop the sender, block the sender, sending it to all those people that haven't received it yet and stop sending it to all those people that haven't um, realized it's a phishing email so some people would click on that forms.office.com and then they'd be going to this dodgy website 
So that dodgy website will be taken down as well. So forward emails off to report at phishing.gov.uk. They've got another one from Microsoft. Microsoft is rather popular. Can anyone see what the error is on this one? So it's from the account security team at no reply at account protection dot microsoft.com it's probably a little bit blurry on your screens but yeah effectively you see the r and the n squeezed up together to look like an m to make it look like microsoft again forward this one off to report at phishing.gov.uk and get this stuff taken down so this is a so yes you can get phishing by emails you can now get um phishing by text so it's called smishing so whatever you can get by email you can now get by text so what do you think of this one? So there's the phone number it's come from. HSBC are trying to contact you to say a new device has been logged onto your account. If it wasn't you, please go to security at HSBC at securepay.com. Well, again, that's nothing to do with HSBC, is it? Always read the internet address backwards. So the last thing you see there is securepay.com. That's nothing to do with HSBC. So it should always end in things like hsbc.com. So if there's anything at the end of it that is taking you somewhere else. So again, this is a moody text message. It's a smishing text message. If you forward this off to 7726, it's free of charge. All of the mobile phone carriers, or carriers, carriers, yeah, carriers, um, have this service available. So if you forward this text message off to 7726, the mobile phone companies on receipt of a couple of complaints will review it and then they will block that phone number from sending it and stop any more being sent out. And also, if it's then sending you to that securepay.com website, they will notify other agencies that then take that website down. So it is a game of cat and mouse and cops and robbers, but the more people report it, the quicker this stuff gets stopped. So 7726 is free of charge and all the mobile phone companies operate it. If you want to know more about it, just Google 7726 and you can read all about it. But that is me done um so i know there's some questions but it's your turn to ask me any question you want please do keep it cyber related um there's one in there do you ever manage to track down these people behind a phishing do you ever get prosecuted so yes is the short version yes we do um certainly when um we set a complaint made to action fraud so in the uk all cyber and economic crime complaints go into action fraud and we then investigate them where there's positive lines of inquiry and the end of the investigation goes to countries where we've got um, diplomatic relations with then yes we do get those people arrested if they end up in countries where we don't have that um, contract or agreement should i say um, we certainly have other disruptive methods um, which can be taken place so yes UK individuals, certainly in the southeast of England, across the UK, um, people are getting arrested every day for cybercrime. It is taking place. Just thinking if there there was the, there's, there's quite a lot of chat there, Chris, but there was one earlier on um, that was presumably the number of breaches is understated as many businesses do not report security breaches. Is that right? So your numbers that you gave originally, presumably they're, they're a minimum. Yeah, so... It is wholly underreported. I think it's just over 30% of businesses do report cybercrime to us. Very good reasons for that. Yes, in the ideal world, we'd love everyone to report it, but certainly people don't realise it's a crime, actually. So they don't report it because they didn't know. Others will phone their IT teams and they just fix it. Um, so why would they report it? Because it's been fixed. Others, um, the bigger they get, um, would phone their solicitors first and go, should we report this? Others will phone their chief financial officers and go, What's the impact on our share price if we report this? Um, so there's lots of different reasons and others will just find their insurance companies say, fix it. I pay you my insurance, just fix it. Mm -hmm. And insurance companies do what they paid to do and fix it. So yes, it's wholly underreported. And I think it's about just over, it's hovering around the 30% of businesses report cybercrime to us, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. It's quite low, actually quite low then, yeah. And um, another couple of questions just to save you kind of um, going through the whole chat because I've been making them down. Um, uh, someone asked for a link for DMARC or DMARC. Is that all right? Is okay. that giving you more slides or is that something you can pop in the chat or can you forward that to me and Natalie so we can forward that on? Is that okay? Um, yeah, certainly. If you, um, I've stopped sharing my screen, haven't I? Let's put yeah. that back up there. There you go. That's the final screen. 
So have a look on the www.secrc.co.uk call membership. Sign up um, or just go to the SECRC page. That's probably easiest. Sign up um, for free call membership. You'll get a welcome pack come through to you. And there's lots of different free products and services on there um, from different agencies, which as a small business you're entitled to for free. Um, and then we can have a conversation um, after you've digested all of that, because it's about 14 pages long. There are pictures in there, so it's not that bad. Um, but yes, um, if you go onto YouTube, um, Global Cyber Alliance, DMARC, there's some what's called DMARC boot camps on there. If you're technical enough to do it yourself, um, then I'd have a look at the Global Cyber Alliance DMARC boot camp. If not, it's one of those, um, speak to me in a couple of weeks' time, we can a range of teams call and we can go through um, some cyber products and services to help keep your business safer. Brilliant. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you, Chris. And um, and you had a special way of saying this, but I can't remember what you said. Are there any free DDoS apps that are okay? I think that was from Lisa. Oh, DDoS. Yes, that's so, it. <laughs> denial of service. And then when it gets a little bit on a manufactured sale or wholesale scale, it's distributed denial of service. There we go. So no, there's not an app because um, it's I'm flooding your business website with loads of traffic. So it's to do with your hosting provider that would have anti DDoS technology in place. It might be like um, a paid for service with your website hosting company. But then if some businesses out there host their own websites, so they need their own DDoS protection. It depends how big you are um, or whether or not you've suffered it before. So. Certainly, I've seen examples of um, a company where they've delivered bad customer service and traditionally people would phone up, phone the complaints department um, or they'd leave you rubbish Google reviews or TripAdvisor reviews. Now we have seen examples of where a customer just thinks, oh, I'm going to DDoS that company, give them a taste of their own medicine. Yes, it's against the law and they shouldn't do that. And we will catch them and they will get prosecuted. Um, but again, it's the different tactics which people are now doing to annoy, disrupt businesses. Um, if you gave me a poor service, yeah, I could shout and scream, but now I've got more things I can do as a criminal. Annoying it is, and it's illegal. But yeah, on some occasions, shouting and scream is illegal, isn't it? Thank you. Um, and, and last but not least, what about if one of your clients or one of your customers gives you a password for you to use and asks you not to change that password? Um, can that affect your system then? Not quite understanding that one. So... so so if you're logging into, I don't know, to somebody else's Zoom account, for example, with their password that they've given you, can yeah. that then affect what goes on on your PC or what goes on on your system? Mm. Right. So if you're logging into someone else's system or product with their password they've given you, mm -hmm. um, depends what that product or service is. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly... There's something called Zoom bombing, where if you you have a waiting room on Zoom, don't you? And you, you only let in people that have been invited to the party, effectively. Yeah. And if you've got a gate crash, you don't let them in. Mm -hmm. That's the, what the Zoom waiting room is all about. So if someone comes in um, and then they put stuff on your screen, you can kick them out. But if they then try to take control of your machine and you give them permission to control your machine, then they can do stuff with it. Mm -hmm. But if you're using someone else's software um, and effectively it's Zoom and you know how to operate it, you don't allow people to do anything with your machine. You mm. don't um, click allow here or approve this if someone's trying to take over your machine. But if you're simply just logging into their software with their permission, mm. and then that's okay to do. Brilliant. Thank you. Brilliant. Has anybody Can else... Can I just follow up on that, just to clarify on that one? It wasn't me who raised, raised it, but um, just to give you an example, Chris. So I'm a consultant and I work with lots of clients. So I have lots of things where clients would set me up on things like their accounting systems and give me a password or would set me up on their kind of project management boards and give me a password. Mm -hmm. Now, I have always then changed my password. So I've never been asked by a client not to change the password because I would want to know why. But I think that's what that question was meaning is. So if I logged into someone else's, say, project, ma project management board, with a password they've given me, does that then make my own system vulnerable if someone's attacking their system? That, that makes so, more sense. Yeah, <laughs> well, exactly. Zoom bombing. <laughs> well said. So you know when you um, get your computer delivered, take it out of the package, plonk it into the power and the internet, and then you're using it. 
most computers when they're first turned on are what's on they're on an administrator's account so you're allowed to do anything you want to do with that computer so you can mm -hmm. download stuff you can edit read delete you can do what you want when you first turn on a computer you need an administrator account and then to complete and undertake all your day-to-day -day activities you need to create an additional account called a, it's, it's usually titled a guest account but it's an account that's got standard user privileges so you do all your day-to-day -day business on standard user privileges so if someone is trying to do something to your computer whether you've given them permission because you didn't realize what you're doing or they've somehow got you to click on a phishing email if you're a standard user account every time the computer is instructed to do something particularly important a box will flash up saying you need administrator privilege to do this and it won't allow it until you type in the password or whether it's windows hello i it's my face or my fingerprint or my pin code it won't let you do anything so the whole point is your it team will always be working on a computer with admin privileges so they can change the configuration of the computer but when you're doing your day-to-day -day business whether you're answering emails you're changing the website you're processing sales and invoices only ever do your business on a day-to-day -day standard user account and there's a lot of safety that comes along with that. So probably you'll have a discussion offline because you start to get a little bit more techy, but certainly make sure you're not using your own business account on an administrator account and you get some extra protection there. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. And, and thank you once again. That was really, really fantastic. I always learn so much when I listen to you. It's, it's really, really good. Um, Obviously, we've, we've come to the end of our session, so there's a sign up there still on the screen um, if you're interested in signing up for that. And also, um, Chris has left his email there if you want to contact him directly to ask any questions or queries, then please do so. Um, but all that remains for me to say is thank you once again. Thank you to everybody for attending. And we hope we see you Thursday for our last webinar of this series where we'll be introducing our digital champions and talking a little bit more about funding and support. So thanks to everybody. Bye now.